Greetings. It's John O'Toole again, as you know from the beginning of this video. Now, interesting enough, you know, I'm old school. I'm old, but I'm old school. And we have this thing called Murphy's Law. And there's a whole list. You can Google it and you can read the whole list. But basically, if it's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong when you don't want it to. <laughs> so, when I was recording my video for the last video of this series, now the inverter that I have, which was my very first video inverter that I ever purchased, and I think it's been like 15 years that I bought that AAA. Now when I kind of think about it, the back of my hide, because I, there's this store in Needham, Massachusetts. Needham, Massachusetts. It's the only one of its kind in the world. If you're going on vacation in Boston, go visit this store. You can go online and shop to your heart's content, but going to the store is just the do it yourself or electronics, electrical gizmo place that's just amazing. If you like wandering around Radio Shack, you are going to be unbelievably crazed in this store. This store is called You Do It Electronics. You can find the store online. You can order anything you want from the store almost online. But it's not the same as going in person. It's worth the drive to the eastern part of the state if you're living in the Berkshires. Granted, I haven't been there for a long time. It's not something my kids enjoy. They're not into electronics. But they do have an entertainment floor on the top. And, you know, it's just an amazing store. So basically what we did is that we went to the point of stripping down the old system, which I had a, a single 55 amp hour 12 volt sealed battery inside a computer case. And I had a uh, UPS, a uh, Cyberlink or something computer case. Have it right here. Bing. That's the power shoot um, battery on. So I had I had that in there, and I was running my computer. Everything in this corner. It was on almost everything on this corner. Not the light behind me. This one right there. That light was just on a power strip. The light in front of me, the desk lamp is on the battery pack. And these lights are optional. These uh, lights I use for, for video are uh, actually on the battery, on the UPS also, but they're not like part of the setup. They're only for uh, recording video. Well, I could, so I guess they're part of the corner. So <laughs> I don't know if that one will stay there a lot. I keep bumping into it with my chair. So. Um, and that all ran off the GPS, and when there would be a grid failure, the, um, the UPS would sense a thing, a signal, and it would send it to the, to Windows 10, and Windows 10 will power down my PC. And then, um, the, the other thing is, is that the UPS will beep, like every five minutes, it'll beep. And you can hear it all over the house, like if you're sleeping. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> the other the thing is that it's not very efficient. So it doesn't utilize that 50 amp hour battery very efficiently. So it's really not for running a long time and uh, working on your computer off grid. Now, oh yeah. I, I, I went off the subject about the inverter. So I think I bought this inverter around 15 years or so 
at you do it while I was poking around. I used to work on printers and copiers and every once in a while you had to find some stupid little thing that it was going to take a week to get. So you'd go poke around at you do it and sometimes you just go there to poke around. I saw an inverter, I think it was on sale. It might have been an open box inverter that was returned. So there might have been an issue with it. But it seems like this is a 700 watt inverter and it's supposed to have a 1500 watt peak. Now that's, the peak is important because when you're figuring out your math for your cable size, you want to figure out the math for the peak of the voltage. Um, so you want to use the 1500 divided by 12 to figure out your wire size so that when you're when something turns on there's always a surge to the line and you have to be able to pull enough current out of the battery with the right size cable. But anywho I've had an issue with this inverter that whenever there's a surge, the inverter would scramble and shut off. And it would do it with incandescent light bulbs, not incandescent, the, um, uh, the, the um, CFL with the little swirly things inside, the little uh, fluorescent tubes inside the bulb. If I had too many of those bulbs, that surge would actually shut down the inverter. You had to turn them on one at a time in order to get them to uh, to work. But it was, you know, it was a workaround. I had the same problem here. So I um, took everything out of this corner and I sorted through all the mad mass of, uh, you know, transformers and stuff to figure out where everything goes. And I moved them all up to my bar on the wall, which I'll show you uh, in a little while when I move the camera over to the wall. And uh, figured out what was what. Pulled everything out of the corner. Put the new board into the corner. Um, and then I hooked up the two batteries uh, in parallel uh, with the cables that I had made in a previous video. And then um, powered it on and it powers on fine. The fan, the cooling fan on it is rather obnoxious, it's noisy. And uh, it's probably normal for that inverter, but I'm sure inverters now are a lot quieter. I know that my 3000 Ames are very quiet when they're running. If you didn't see the LEDs on, you wouldn't know the thing was on. So. That was something that I wasn't really too crazy about listening to all the time because originally my idea was that I would just run on the uh, IOTA battery charger converter and uh, stay that way. But it wasn't quite happy that way. So the surges, it kept surging and shutting off and it would shut off everything. And, uh, it's not one of those times that it was surging. It also set a spike to my my uh, computer, which ended up crashing my C drive, which really was not a fun thing at all, because I had to uh, restore from a backup and bring it up. But I lost about a month's work, which was oddly enough, five of the videos that I had worked on the series, <laughs> which is always saying, put your computer on a UPS, read the lips, UPS. <laughs> because you got to have some protection for brownouts. I mean, I've been here be working and I will see the lights dim and kick back on and I'll get a report from the UPS saying, you know, that there was a low voltage condition and the UPS will cover that. So, and protect your system and that's what it's there for. And it'll also do is if there's a power failure, it'll do a soft shutdown of your computer versus a hard shutdown, which, you know, pulling the plug on the computer is a gray area about whether it's good or not. Often it's not, unless you're in a desperate, I can't get my computer to boot up thing. 
So that was the end result of my playing around with the new pin. So really what I need to do is order maybe like a 300 watt um, pure sine wave inverter and that will run enough of the corner when there's a power failure for me to get by. Now in the long run, if I had knew this inverter was not going to work, it would have made sense to buy the PIP inverter and put it in there and I could have the, uh, the automatic switch over and stuff. But I wasn't thinking that far ahead. And even though some of you think that I'm a real special fairy, I'm not that clairvoyant. Although they were probably telling you, hey, John, don't be a fool. Go the other route. But I wasn't listening. So I went this route. And look at what happened. We had a great video explaining about how things work and how they all end the game. Because if I went the other route, a lot of these explanations wouldn't have been necessary. <laughs> it's a funny thing. So, at any rate, I ended up putting my computer back on the UPS. And actually, I had a second UPS that had a new battery in it. I bought them both around the same time, but I had upgraded into a new battery. Um, so, it's its runtime is 28 minutes until the system will shut down. And it will most likely shut it down before that. So there's a USB cable that plugs into the UPS and then plugs in the computer and then it, it all kind of like watches each other. So, you know, it's a, it's kind of a good thing. So now if there's a power failure before I get another inverter, I can just plug in my um, my router power supply and you know the internet will stay up while I'm uh, waiting to power to get restored so all is in lost if I had gone a thousand watt inverter then my wire sizes would have a lot bigger and I think my 50 amp or 100 amp batteries may not be enough to run uh, anything that I would tend to run on it. It would run for a short period of time. So going this route and going with the lower wattage and just using it for my corner works for me. Now I can run extension cords all through the house to power things if I want to uh, from the other side of the house, but extension cords become a trip hazard for me. You know, you get old and you know, some things get harder to step over than others. You, you don't want to be walking around in the dark with extension cords that could trip you, you know, in the middle of the night. So that's where I'm at. But all these videos, they kind of give you a kind of a, a clearer idea about how to create your own battery backup system. And if you live in the Berkshires, you should have some way of sustaining yourself. You shouldn't just rely on um, the, the grid 100%. And if you've been here a while, then you know that. If you're young and very young, you might just think, what's the big deal? I'll go off and party and come back and the power will be back on. You might lose all your uh, food in the refrigerator and freezer, but you know that's immaterial. You just go out and buy more. So, and remember, many people recommend you should have at least two weeks of sustainable food in your place, whether it's your apartment or your home or your RV. I guess on your back of your bicycle would be a little extreme, but uh, you should have some ways to sustain yourself. You should have many medication, you should have some supplies. You know, you should have some things to, to occupy yourself. You should have a way of surviving and not be completely uh, dependent. And as you can see from this last, you know, several months of the shutdown, and many people had to learn to cook themselves because they couldn't get out and go to a grocery store or they couldn't go out and go out to a restaurant every single day of the week. Okay, so... 
this is the setup that I have now. So over here on the right is my PC that I built myself as is my editing computer. And then as you can see on the bottom, there are two batteries. Needs to say they wouldn't have fit in the computer case because the new battery is is the same same amp hours, but it's a different shape. Now I have room there for a third battery, but it interferes with me getting to my computer when I have to do some repairs and stuff. So this, I'm not likely going to go up more than this. We'll see, but I don't think I will. I do have extra cables that if I want to do that, I can. And up on top, you can see that there is a power strip there. They have these at Home Depot. It's a four foot wire mold power strip. And I can plug most of my stuff into it that I need in this area. And of course, they're all full, but most of them are transformers. And then uh, on top of the batteries is the UPS. And uh, so the UPS plugs into uh, a power strip that I have that's a, uh, supposed to be a surge protector power strip. And that white cord you see plugged into it is the only thing plugged into it is the um, is the power is the long power strip that runs along the wall and that will shut down that whole power ball if it shuts down and then if i want to in a course of an emergency is to unplug the one plug that is going to the um, router and plug it into the top of the power supply now down the road i'm going to replace that with a um, a 300 watt pure sign inverter which will be better for the application so right now it is running on charge from the iota battery charger it is now going into the batteries and to keep them at a charged state and the only other thing i would add would be a power meter just to monitor the voltage of the circuit and that'll show me, it'll be 14 volts when it's in the charge. And if it's when there's no power, it'll go down to 12. And then around 10 volts, the inverter will turn off. But the draw from it from the router should be relatively uh, small. So that is a basic system. And it's really not that difficult. As you can see, most of the issues with, with uh, building your own system is, you, is the cabling. Uh, making your own cables is much more efficient and inexpensive. But there's more work involved. Now you can get all the cables you need pre-made, but you lose some of your flexibility. And some batteries, like I say, will already have bus bars to connect the batteries inter interconnected. So that all you really have to do is connect the positive and negative lead to the battery. Now, the, So one of the components that's not on the board, and I should have ordered it, and I should have known better, and I should have, I should have, I should have. But I didn't. <laughs> and that component is called a shunt. Now the shunt is hooked up on the negative side of the battery lead going back to the battery. And it's hooked up in series to it. And what a shunt does is it's a very low resistant block, but it's a special block in which you, that a meter will read the current going through the wire. And this is important to know is how much the batteries are using while you're actually pulling your uh, loads off the inverter. So that's something I didn't hook up. Now some of those fuses that I got, the A&L fuses, 
they had that built into it. And when I was going through my ordering, I didn't think. Do you believe I didn't think about it long enough? <laughs> so I could have I could have gotten a fuse that would have had a one in there, and it would it would give me battery voltage and give me the current or the amperage going through the wire. But um, you know, so now it's backtrack. Now some inverters will give you that information. It's built into the inverter. And some don't. Tell you the truth, most don't. Because they expect that you would actually put one in the system. There's Victotron is one of them. Um, there's a number of them on there. Um, current meter, uh, battery status is, I think, the name that you want to look up. And it will give you a couple of different ones. A very popular one being used these days is Victron. It's a little pricey. But uh, you get what you pay for it because it already knows that you're going to interface it with a computer. Whereas some of the other models, there's another one, uh, is it uh, Begot or uh, uh, um, Bogart, I think, that um, I should know what I use. I use one, I think it's called uh, Bogart. And uh, I, it's a straight reading you can push a button and it'll tell you um, what the status is of the batteries i can check more than one battery bank with it which is kind of nice um, but it doesn't interface with the computer I, i'd have to add an accessory to it and that's just another thing to buy versus the victron is designed to interface with the computer uh, so that, that just gives you an extra step ahead so, I mean, there's just different options out there for you. And it's kind of a good idea to get an accurate reading about what the battery voltage is and the current, just if you're, like, keeping track of things. Particularly if you want to plug something in, he, instead of waiting for the, for the uh, inverter to scramble and shut down, it would be nicer to know that you're getting close to your capacity on your wattage. So, you say, well... I won't blow my hair tonight. I'll wait till the morning when the sun is up and I'm getting that extra power coming in from the sun. See, that's another thing about solar. If you're using solar to charge your batteries and run your inverter, during the day when the sun is at noon and you're getting your maximum power onto your, onto your solar panels, that uh, that's a good time to run a lot of your high current things, do your baking, do your vacuuming, uh, blow your hair, you know, those kind of things that ironing, all those things that use a great deal of power at the time. And don't wait and do it at night because things are slow. At nighttime, when you're running on battery, that is the time to mostly just be off grid and take it easy. You know, your TV on, I got a light or two, you know, cooking on your charcoal grill or your gas grill, you know, very minimal. You could cook on the stove because that just has that spark, but if you're going to use the oven, you've got that 500 watt um, bar that's going to light the gas flame for your thing and that's going to continue to pulse every time it wants to burst some heat into the oven. If it's a gas stove, if it's an electric stove, that's a whole other ball game as far as the power consumption. And using that at night may not be the best thing if you don't have a massive battery bank. So it's just all these little things. But the best thing to do, if you have an interest in doing something like this, is build a small system. But I suggest going 24 or 48 in best category Go, tw uh, go with a 48 volt uh, battery bank and then get a 48 volt inverter. There's a number of them on there. American companies, Magnum is great. Um, they have great customer service. Um, there's a number of them. You know, go on the Aldi store and look around. Just look around, look at the marine inverters. You got to decide whether you need 220 or 110. If you're going to operate a well pump, a deep well pump, that's most likely running on 220. So if you don't ever pump water when the grid is down, you're going to need that. 
hot water heater. That might be something that you kind of live without. But the good thing about it is if you're running on a, um, a, a tank, a full tank water heater, that hot water is going to stay in that tank for a while through your power failure. If you're going, I recommend the, um, the hybrid water heaters that have a, a heat pump in it because they use a far less electricity. And there are some techniques out there if you were 100% off the grid to run that thing without having it to be a high current device. And uh, that's something you can hit me up on YouTube and I can send you in the direction that you can find out more about that. Um, so th I hope this kind of gives you a good explanation of some place to start. I would suggest, you know, doing some kind of small system as an emergency backup to get you by. You can run a generator. You can have a, uh, you know, get a, a, um, a transfer switch with a, uh, you know, a, you know, off grid load, a standby load panel. You know, the electrician will come in, put it all in, set it all up for you so you can safely run your generator in your house. Your generator outside your house, not in your house, but you can run the generator for your house in a power failure. And you, all you're going to do is trumps out in the middle of the storm or the snow and mud and get that thing going and switch over uh, onto the transfer panel and run the uh, required energies of the house. Never ever run any kind of generator inside your house that's running on fossil fuels. So, without further ado, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I wish you all the very, very best in these crazy times, and they are crazy, and I hope you keep a light on for me and my fairies, because my fairies love you more than I do. Bye-bye. <laughs>